Welcome to our week 9 lecture for Composing with Sound, entitled Data as a Source for Musical Sound. In this lecture, we're going to spend a little bit more time looking ahead to the final assessment task, and we're going to discuss the concept of data sonification with a bit of a demonstration. Our goals in this session are to brainstorm project ideas and to consider arbitrary data as a bearer of aesthetic form. And finally, to become familiar with ideas around data science and sound design. So just uh, reiterating the task description for assessment three, in this assessment, you'll be producing a three minute composition or a demonstration for, for example, interactive systems. And you'll be producing a max patch file to submit, plus each student will develop an individual 1000 word report. Now you're working in pairs. I think we have two teams of three as well. And in your teams, you'll be creating an original max patch for presentation of a novel sound composition. So novel means it's original, something that you've produced yourselves. The composition is going to be presented in week 12. Could be a fixed work, it could be an interactive system or a performance system, and we're gonna discuss the distinctions between those. As well as demonstrating technical proficiency, students are encouraged to make careful considered choices regarding the presentation context and the audience experience. A single max patch is to be produced and presented by each pair of students. Each individual student will produce separate written documentation that aims to integrate their own research into the theoretical, cultural and creative background of the project with a report on the chosen forms, methods, materials and technical design employed in the project. All patch and document files are to be submitted online. OK, so we want to unpack some of those ideas initially to help clarify exactly what it is that you're uh, supposed to submit for assessment. So you'll be, assessing, you'll be submitting the uh, patch files and Word document at the end of week 11, and you'll be presenting it in class in week 12. You'll have four minutes to present your three-minute work. We'll have 15 minutes of setup time at the beginning of the 90 minute session and two minutes to change over from one uh, group to another. Now that all should just about fit into 90 minutes. You'll present the material at your computer and we'll do uh, what we did in the second assessment, which is to take the headphone output of your machine and play it back through the loudspeakers in the tutorial room. So we want to unpack the task description in terms of its uh, keywords. So these are the keywords for the practical side of the task. Uh, fixed works. Uh, performance system is one similar to the system that we designed for assessment two. Interactive systems are ones where the performance is not so structured, uh, where not just you, but other people could interact with the system. And once again, I mentioned last week to, you know, just think about how you're going to present this uh, in the context of the computer lab. It's a strange sort of performance context, but you want to be thinking about how that's going to work uh, before you uh, present. OK, so what are fixed works? A fixed work might be an algorithmic composition for which you click a button and it runs by itself perhaps using some of the synthesis techniques we've looked at. Uh, check out the week six exploring coal patch for uh, ideas about how to use collections. We're going to look more at this in the tutorial this week. We'll also look at some ideas around data sonification this week. So there might be some concepts there or techniques that you want to pick up and uh, exploit. Performance systems. My whistle patch from last week is, is an example of a performance system. That patch had an echo and reverb effect working with live audio signal from a microphone. Uh, we'll look more at these designs in week 10, but you can check out the examples uh, and tutorials in Max. A wah-wah pedal, you know, an extended guitar pedal. 
is, is another example of this kind of approach. This approach is what we call live signal processing, and it requires you to have your own audio interface. Another approach to performance system is what we did in week seven with live control of re real-time synthesis. Obviously, there would be an expectation that you take this in new and original directions. One more approach to performance is for live MIDI processing. So you might think here uh, about, uh, you know, an, uh, an arpeggiator as a design concept. Here's an example. Okay, so another one of these keywords is interactive systems. Interactivity is a broad concept that could encompass responsive systems, such as an instrument, all the way through to artificial intelligence, where the response of the system is unpredictable. Interactive systems often target engagement with a general audience with the system and therefore offer simplified and easy operation or playability. We saw an example of this in the uh, Soundboards project. So finally, with the practical aspects, considering the choices regarding the presentation context and the audience experience, uh, obviously you're presenting in the lab, standing or sitting behind a computer. Um, we won't have screen projection. Uh, I know from last, uh, last time we tried this that uh, didn't work. We'll just use the audio. Uh, that is unless you're using video, in which case we'll make a special effort. Uh, so please let me know about that. Yes, it's a weird context. Uh, make the most of it. Give your piece a title and announce it clearly at the start. Uh, there's no need for a speech or explanation. Just let the audience know you're about to start. And make sure you've rehearsed in the space and that you have a, a structure or a score for the presentation. Interactive works are a bit more risky unless you sneakily get one of your colleagues to rehearse uh, before the presentation. So that, that might be worth thinking about. Okay, so much for the keywords from the practical task, part of the task description. Now uh, the concepts and context, the written part. Okay, so integrate is one of the keywords. Show the links between the things you've researched and the patch that you made. Uh, each individual will want to research specific aspects that they can write about. Theoretical is a keyword. Uh, it could be a concept such as randomness, data, harmonic progression, counterpoint, etc. Research, research the key concepts uh, that will help you to present the theoretical background. It could be the cultural and creative background. Consider the cultural and creative background. Who has done this before? When, how, and why. Do some research. Present your research appropriately referenced. Forms, methods, materials, and technical design. Okay, so these words are perhaps a little bit more abstract. We're really looking for a description of your design, the techniques, perhaps the synthesis methods that you've used. Materials could include sounds or performance interface. What are the bits and pieces? What are the sounds? What are the elements that you've put together? What's the form of the piece? You also want to demonstrate the insight uh, that you have generated uh, in your written explanation and reasoning behind the compositional design. 
make sure you include academic and musical references. You might want to reference YouTube videos, but don't make all of your references YouTube videos where in the second year of our undergraduate degree now, you need to demonstrate that you know how to find and evaluate the quality of the reference material that you're presenting for your work. Finally, you're going to be marked on the clarity, accuracy of your written expression. Think about the structure of it. Does it have an introduction and a conclusion? Have you used technical terms effectively? Have you, have you developed well-formed sentences and collected related ideas together in paragraphs? So these are the criteria for assessment, and you can see that they're divided into group and individual components. The group mark is given for the presentation complexity and usability of the patch. Remember all the points that you, uh, all the points that we picked up on in assessment number two, the careful use of comments. You can uh, attribute patch ideas in a comment in the patch. You'll be marked on the creativity and compositional coherence of the presentation. So this is really about the composition itself. Does it have a beginning and a middle and an end? Uh, does it sound great? And uh, the technical quality of the presentation, making sure that there's no noise, unwanted noise and distortion, and that everything does what you expect it to do in the performance. Is it well rehearsed? The individual mark is really for the uh, written component, the insight of the written explanation and reasoning behind the compositional design, including the use of academic and musical references. And uh, you're obviously written, you're obviously assessed on the clarity and accuracy of your written presentation. So 50% of the practical 50% of the mark is on the practical realization of the composition project. That's the group mark. And 50% is on your written component, the conceptualization and contextualization. So when you're looking to do your research, make sure you exploit the readings and any additional uh, research that you can think through and demonstrate the development of your idea. So get started right away to generate ideas that are going to make your project richer. Don't think about the research as something that you add on at the end in order to make up this uh, assessment component, the written assessment component. Use the research to help develop rich and interesting ideas for your project. Uh, review the example patch collection on UTS Online. Check out some of the community projects linked on the Cycling74 website. But be prepared to take ideas and simplify them to make them something that you can realise in the context of the remaining time that we have left. So we're presenting the works in week 12 uh, in class. Got five minutes each, 15 minutes to set up, six minutes each, gives us 70 minutes, should have enough time to get through everybody in, an, in the 90 minute session. Very quick changeover between pieces and you're presenting at your computer. So to summarise, the group part of the mark is based on your three-minute composition presented to the class in week 12, and the patch file submitted to UTS Online in week 11. You'll find the submission link on the assessment uh, link on UTS Online, and your individual mark is based on a thousand-word report submitted in week 11. Okay, so we've got time now uh, to field some questions about your projects. So I'll just stop the video here and, uh, and take some questions. But make sure after the lecture that you get together with your team member and get the discussion uh, going so that you've got some real concrete material to work on in the tutorial. The second half of the lecture, it will be focusing on concepts around data science and data sonification. Okay, data science is defined as a multidisciplinary field that uses scientific methods, processes, algorithms, and systems to extract knowledge and insight from structured and unstructured data. 
So there's a great article on data science uh, on Wikipedia. So in attempting to map out the relationship between data science and data sonification, one of the key researchers in this area, uh, the Australian uh, composer and researcher David Worrell, uh, provides the following uh, definitions. So one aspect of data sonification is auditory display. So thinking about this as an analogy to visual display, the display of data through sound. Uh, he also suggests that data sonification is a mapping of numerically represented relations in some domain under study to relations in an acoustic domain for the purposes of interpreting, understanding, or communicating relations in the domain under study. So the domain under study could be uh, weather science, uh, it could be uh, financial data, trading markets, that sort of thing. And uh, this idea of mapping the relationships between various data in, in one of those domains uh, to relationships in the acoustic domain. Uh, so simplified, that is the representation of data relations in sound relations. So what sort of sound relations might be relevant? We could think of uh, the relations of pitch, for example, or of timbre, or of a note duration, or of rhythm. These, these we might consider as sound relations. So there are a broad set of uh, classes of data sonification. So we might think first about uh, discrete uh, representations. At the third stroke, it will be 10, 30, 9, and 40 seconds. So in this example, we have a speech as a discrete representation of data. Um, we also have the use of tones to represent uh, the passage of time. A second example is auditory warnings, alarms or alerts. So a ringing bell, depending on the context, may have a number of different meanings. Uh, when you're at school, it might mean it's the end of lesson time or the end of lunchtime. Uh, in a building, it might be a fire alarm, for example. Another class in uh, sonification are what's known as auditory icons. Now, an icon is something that represents something in the real world, and it usually uses uh, some, a metaphorical relationship between the icon and the thing in the world. And we can, and there are a great set of uh, examples of this kind of matching of action uh, or, uh, or affordance in a user interface through these metaphorical auditory icons. So here are some examples from the Apple user interface. So this is the sound of a photographic camera with, uh, with the shutter and the, and the machine winding sound. Now, you've probably never heard one of these in, in real life, but, uh, um, but it's a metaphor for taking a picture of, a, of an area of the screen. Okay, so this is uh, an auditory icon for uh, deleting a file uh, and it involves the representation of a throwing of a piece of paper into a waste paper basket with it bouncing around. Uh, so it really captures the idea of the action of uh, disposing of, uh, of an item. So this is deleting something, so it's uh, screwing a piece, piece of paper. Uh, moving something from one location to another. And once again, emptying a waste paper basket. An earcon, in contrast, uh, 
represents something in the way that uh, an auditory icon does, but instead of using some metaphorical or representation of a physical object or action, uh, it uses abstract sounds, for example, a melody or a rhythm. So this uh, little melodic phrase represents uh, an incoming message in a messaging app, for example. Okay, so those are discrete representations. We have a single event and a single set of sounds uh, to represent uh, some function of a, of a user interface, for example, or to provide data in the case of, um, in the case of the talking clock. Continuous representations, on the other hand, take a variable or a varying piece uh, of data or information, some numerical content, and display it in a continuous form of varying audio content. So uh, one example of this is audification, which is a direct translation of, audio, of data into audio, and I'll show you a little example of this in a minute. Um, or parametric mapping, where we have some variable data that's mapped onto some parameter, acoustic parameter, such as pitch or loudness or timbre. And I'll show an example of this. Uh, then we have uh, interactive data representation. So rather than just uh, passively uh, displaying data um, through sound, uh, in interactive data representations, such as sound graphs, we can interactively explore the data so that the data representation becomes like a, a playground or a, a, an instrument in which we can explore, move through the data uh, interactively. So uh, once again, I'll give a little bit of an example of this. Then there is, uh, because this field has been going now for um, you know perhaps 20 years, uh, it's become an area where artists have wanted to explore uh, the idea of using data creatively uh, as a, an element within a musical composition. And uh, we call this data music. Okay, so I'm going to use the help patch of the SF Play object to show what it sounds like uh, when we load up some arbitrary data and uh, and and display it as a sound. So here we go. Okay, so here in the help patch for the SF Play object under the raw tab, uh, we can open any file and we can tell SF Play how to treat the data in the file. So for example, we could suggest to suggest that the data in the file be interpreted as 8-bit bytes, integers of data, or as floating point numbers, or as compressed audio. So I'm just going to treat it as 8-bit uh, bytes. We can give it an offset into the file to read. We can specify the sampling rate and the number of channels. So here are the default 16-bit uh, stereo 44.1. Let's go and find a file. So here I have a PDF as uh, rather arbitrary piece of data, uh, or PDF of William James' 1890 Principles of Psychology. You can see it's a, a scanned book from the um, Google Books project. And let's just open that and play the data that's in that file uh, imagining that it's 16-bit uh, digital audio is what it sounds like. Okay, you get the idea. It's uh, pretty noisy, uh, and uh, and it might make more sense to take something like, uh, um, let's say, earthquake data and uh, directly sonify it. Okay, in this example patch, uh, we can see a kind of data music approach to mapping, uh, parametric mapping of continuous data. So the data that we're looking at is a data set that I downloaded uh, off the internet. Um, there's various collections of data out there on the internet. So you can see on the left of the slide here, a little piece of a um, Excel spreadsheet. 
first column gives the date and the second column gives this uh, floating point uh, fractional number, which is labeled index. And the data comes from something called the Cleveland Financial Stress Index from the years 1991 to 2016. So there's a there's a separate entry uh, for every day. It looks um, like from that uh, from that period, that uh, 25 year period. And here's a graph made in Excel that shows how that um, data varies uh, throughout this period. So you can see. 2008 is the uh, global financial crisis, and you can see so this uh, financial stress, whatever it is, it's, it must be a measure of uh, consumer sentiment, uh, really goes off the scale here um, and, uh, and varies. So in the Max patch uh, that you can see, uh, Max is being used to load this data from a text file and then uh, sonify it by uh, creating a kind of musical sound out of that material. Let's have a listen and see what that sounds like. So you can see in the in the max patch we have the date indicated, uh, and uh, this is the day number, the month, the year, and the value of the of the stress index. We've got one, two, three separate synths that are linked to this data in some way, and a visual display of the stress level, which I've indicated max stress at the top and max chill at the bottom and uh, zero stress in the middle. Uh, and this is what it sounds like. Now I can manipulate it in terms of the rate at which it, it reads through the data. So we'll have a listen, see what that sounds like. Okay, so that's a little bit of fun, a demonstration of what we might call data music, uh, data sonification. And you can explore the contents of, of that patch. So one key aspect of the design of systems of this kind is what we call uh, parameter mapping, or just generally mapping. So we have a data source and we, we can think about how we map that onto uh, aspects or parameters within the synthesis algorithm that we're using. So in, in, that, uh, in that patch, we've got um, a sort of FM drone and these little percussive uh, synthesizer sounds. And you would have heard that generally the index is linked to pitch. And I use the rate or the tempo as something that I could manually control. So one approach, one sophisticated approach to data mapping takes the um, values in the data source 
and maps them to some intermediate representation of a perceptual parameter, something that we can perceive uh, in, in sound. So that might be pitch or it might be timbre or loudness. Uh, and we achieve those perceptual results by knowing how to control the parameters of our synthesizer. Uh, for example, frequency, modulation, uh, uh, gain, and various other parameters that might be in our, in our synth. Um, and, uh, and have those parameters drive the synthesis algorithm itself to produce the audio output. So this would this would be a this would make sense. It would be a um, a logical kind of design process to think about what those perceptual parameters that we want to affect are, and then figure out what parameters in the synthesis algorithm we need to modify in order to achieve achieve those effects. Here's an example of a a, a patch put together by uh, one of our past students. Uh, Martin Peplow, and uh, he designed this sort of general purpose, multi purpose sonification tool for taking data sets and then uh, using them to drive VST plugins. It was quite a sophisticated project as part of his uh, honors project in 2018. So that's the end of our presentation. Um, we've spent a bit of time looking again at the final project, and I want to make sure that in our tutorial we spend time actually developing the projects with me answering questions, helping you troubleshoot patch ideas. And then the second half of the lecture is really looking at the whole world of data sonification as a, um, a, a new kind of novel approach to composing with sound uh, and one that really takes the uh, affordances of music programming and applies it in a, in a creative way. And that concludes the lecture. There's some useful references there for you. Um, and uh, please store up your questions and ask them now or in the tutorial. Thanks for listening.